Michael Rodutsky was the producer of that piece and was the person most instrumental in securing the interview. I mean, he spent a lot of time with McVeigh's lawyer at the time. I had met with uh, McVeigh's first lawyer before that, um, and uh, with Michael, uh, met with the second lawyer. Um, and I mean, I, obviously everyone wanted to talk to McVeigh. Uh, you had to have a comfort level with his attorney who would make a rec recommendation to him. And McVeigh has a comfort level with whoever he's watching on the screen. Uh, and uh, he was certainly familiar with the work of, I'm sure, most of the people who wanted to interview him. And, and uh, he decided to go with us. Um, Did he was, choose you specifically or? Well, I, he was, I was the only choice he had at 60 Minutes. Uh, although, I mean, because we had been working on the story and, and we try to be in a position where we're not competing against ourselves so that no one else was pushing him. But I'm, I'm sure if, if, if he had said, I want to do 60 Minutes, but I, I don't want to talk to Bradley, uh, uh, but I'll talk to Mike Wallace, uh, I think while we wouldn't like it, uh, we would have said okay, uh, given the nature of that interview. Most of the time we wouldn't, but given that one, I, I'm sure we probably would have. Fortunately, it didn't come to that. Uh, what was like walking in that room and sitting down with him? What was the temperature well, like? Uh, I was in the room when they brought him in, and he was in handcuffs, and they said you could have no contact, so that eliminated the, what do you do, shake hands with this guy? Uh, that eliminated that problem for me. Uh, and he sat down and, you know, we said hello and exchanged some pleasantries and we started talking. I mean, there wasn't a lot of buildup because we had a limited period of time. So you really had to, to get this done and, and you don't have time to sit down and chit-chat for an hour. Uh, you come in and you start rolling. Um, there were two crews, uh, four people in the room, plus Michael and Trevor Nelson, who was the associate producer, and perhaps a half a dozen uh, prison officials. And uh, it, um, he was at times easy and at times difficult. Um, at times, as I said to the uh, family members and survivors last week in Oklahoma City, that there were times when I sat there talking to him and had the realization that he was not unlike millions of other young American men. He was someone you wouldn't give a second look if you saw him. And then there were other times when you sat there and you realized that this guy was a cold-blooded killer. So there was always that going back and forth. Uh, and, and there also was a restriction because one of the agreements uh, that we made, uh, his lawyer would not let us ask him directly, were, were you the Oklahoma City bomber? Are you the Oklahoma City bomber? Did you do that? Are you responsible for that? So I couldn't do that because that would have been the end of the interview. Uh, we had agreed not to, but you just sort of looked at a way to get in through the side door, the back door. Uh, he had been convicted for it, and I think it was clear uh, that he was admitting that he had done it without saying it directly. Were there concerns that it was an opportunity, an outlet, to uh, express his militant views to the country? Yeah, but he doesn't have control of the microphone. Um, and what we want to do is to tell his story. Uh, and and. Part of that is to get some kind of understanding of what, how do you get to a point where you can deliberately drive a truck with a 7,000 pound homemade bomb in it and set it off to take the lives of people, children, women, and men. You don't even know? 
who never did anything to you, they are not the government. I mean, those children didn't work for the government. Part of allowing him to explain his views is to get some understanding of how he came to do what he did. And as one of the, the family members told me last week in Oklahoma City, I just want him to stand up and tell me why he did this. And when he talks about how there were transgressions that people made in at Ruby Ridge in, in Oklahoma in in, uh, in Waco. What transgressions did we in Oklahoma City make against you? Uh, so yes, there is the sense that you're going to give him a platform for these views, uh, but there's also a recognition that you have to deal with the understanding of how those views led to that act. Uh, and in painting that bigger picture, that's a risk that you run. And on the piece that you're airing this Sunday, what were, what were your goals on updating that story? Well, uh, the goal was simple. I mean, we had the only broadcast interview that he had done. Um, and, I mean, it's amazing how much attention has been focused on his execution. So it's, it was a perfect opportunity to say, what do we have here and, and, and how can we make good journalistic use out of this? Uh, and, and our sense was that we wanted to give the family members and the survivors the last word. We wanted them to look at what he had to say and respond to it. So that's the way we did this piece. We could have just, we could have put on two pieces or three pieces to say, here's what Timothy McVeigh had to say. But we wanted to let Timothy McVeigh give his point of view and then let women and men who had lost members of their family or who had survived that bombing say what they felt about what they went through and about Timothy McVeigh. Let them have the last.